Good morning, dear friends and colleagues. We are starting with the second day of the workshop. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Um, I will I will not uh, take any more minutes because we are a little bit uh, behind the schedule, and I will invite Valida to uh, uh, to join us and say a few words on how to fight ethnopopulism in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Valida comes from Faculty of Political Sciences in the University of Sarajevo, together with Sead Turcalo, who will speak also in this session. And in this session also we are going to have Filip Milacic, uh, who is a fellow of the University of Rijeka, Center for Advanced Studies, our partner institution, and a uh, person who should uh, be with us yesterday, but uh, he was excused, Srđan Milošević from Institute for Re Recent History, who will address us in the end of this line. So, Valida, please. So, I have to admit I don't have the answer <laughs> to the title that we, that we have here. Actually, this is my new project, mm -hmm. very beginning of the project on populism. And um, the aim of my project is actually to analyze populism in unspecific uh, ethno-national political system. And um, we have different political options in Bosnia and Herzegovina, both right and left, and they are using populist discourse. And uh, one of the main goal is actually to, to analyze this left populist discourse because we have some people who started to study um, right-wing populists in Bosnia and Herzegovina. But both sides are using this discourse as, an, as a, generally as an empty political style or uh, their manipulative political strategy that is based on the rhetoric of war and fear. Uh, populism is really hard to define. In the 60s, Berlin, UNESCO and Gellner tried to do something. Contemporary thought is struggling also with this, I like to use Taggart uh, concept, anti-phenomenon. And we have different, uh, different uh, definitions, lack of the theoretical literature and uh, lack of the methodological empirical research as well. Uh, the most uh, popular contemporary definition is that of Kas Mude, that this is an ideology that considers society to be separated into two uh, antagonistic and homogeneous groups, the pure people versus the corrupt elite, and which argues that politics should be an expression of the volonté générale of the people. So the people is a uh, highly ambiguous concept. I use uh, also Reinhard Heinisch um, definition uh, from 2017. Uh, he um, says that uh, populism uh, is combination of political style that is um, used um, with, the, with the rhetoric or by the leader, uh, then uh, political strategy uh, and political organization, and the third one is political ideology, often thin ideology based on some other real ideologies. And you have different combinations of these three or two or just one, one trait. Uh, Camelonic nature, is something that is uh, linked to, to populism. Uh, we have authoritarian op populism, neo-populism uh, in contemporary societies, uh, malaise of democracy. Um, we have individual level populism, party level. We have movements left or right, or left and right, as we um, saw in France with Marine Le Pen, 
who said that she, um, she has uh, red votes. Um, historical and political context, United States, they have um, historically present uh, populism in their political system, in Latin America as well, as a vertical cleavage between the classes. But now this neo-populism is something that is really interesting to analyze. Um, as a result of globalization, migration, neoliberal ideology, conflicts, in Western EU context is much easier to, to study uh, this concept because we have we are dealing with consolidated party system and post communist context is um, more complex, especially our context of post conflict society. Uh, with the ethno national political system in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have non developed party system, around 150 parties registered. We have suspicious privatization and wide, widely present corruption. Bosnian right style, uh, they use, of course, political ideology as a thin ideology, populism based on nationalism. In Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, we, we have many parties, Party of Democratic Action, Union for a Better Future of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatian Democratic Union. In Republika Srpska, we have Alliance of Social Independent Democrats, Highly Nationalistic Party, Serb Democratic Party, etc. Bosnian left style is also empty, uh, thin ideology based on civic nationalism. We have this populism only in Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina and actually my case study in this project will be Democratic Front and Željko Komšić, the leader of this party. <laughs> Ethnic populism, um, we have many uh, publications on the complexity of our political system. Uh, authors Mujkić, Čurak, Šačić, Džihić, Bieber and the others. Populism is somehow always present in all those uh, publications and projects, but it's um, rarely directly um, addressed. Uh, it's a pioneer and research. Uh, this is actually pioneer research on populism. We have few, two articles actually on this. Uh, Jananovic Mirasche and Karamehic on populist political communication and the role of media and Savic Bojanic on folksy politics in an ethno-nationalist partitocracy, so really recent uh, publications. Um, ethnic populism in Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's really hard to find appropriate theoretical framework, but I use Ernesto Laclau. Um, so this is not uh, the definition of the populism that is using uh, uh, vertical cleavage, but horizontal cleavage between uh, different ethnic groups. Um, this is thin ideology based on nation, ethno-nationalism, insisting on organic traditional society in 21st century. And what is, um, what is uh, peculiarity is that there is no antagonism between the people and the elite, but between the people and the other people, between us the, and them, and we have this permanent mutual contestation. They use aggressive individual style, Milorad Dodik. Um, he started as a darling of the international community, and now he is a man of the people. He is using political discourse on secession every day unless he needs the money from, from the World Bank or some other international financial organizations. On the other hand, we have in Federation Bakir Izetbegovic, he inherited charisma and uh, he's using this also permanent discourse of war and, um, and um, fear. We have Fahrudin Radončić, Media Mogu, using Berlusconi style. The common thing for all of them is empty rhetoric as a strategy. Um, they all started, um, um, except SNSD in uh, Republika Srpska in 1990s as nationalist movements. They were basing the ideology on freedom uh, and um, freedom of the nation and um, statehood. 
um, they go through nationalist, will be a nationalistic parties and uh, my thesis is that we have now political cartels as an organizational style based on political clientelism of ethnic people, based on nepotism and corruption and uh, it's, really, it's really something that is um, popular. They pay 25 euro for a vote, all of them. Left is unfortunately without vision. So this is the reason that I will focus on um, left. Uh, we have complex socioeconomic conditions, still they are not addressing vertical cleavages. They are not addressing the questions of solidarity. Uh, they do not know anything about Marxism. Um, they also um, <coughs> use uh, discourse on genocide, um, war, borders, migrant crisis, and so on. So uh, they are sometimes opposition or position, and they do really <coughs> operate only with numbers, statistics, and electoral interest. Uh, for instance, Željko Komšić is a man of the people, so socio-democrat, so social democrat, with five different mandates, two as a member of Presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina. He's using permanent discourse of war, fear, patriotism, ambiguous civic nationalism. Um, to bring again Laclau, uh, he's using the people as an empty signifier, but in his case we do not know who is the other people actually. Um, He's, um, 20, he has 20 years of power, no initiatives or results, only an angry emotional style. Um, I will conclude this, this short presentation here. Uh, actually, what I'm trying to, to, um, to see and um, to confirm uh, is that in ethnic populism, we, of course, don't have a um, uh, cleavage between the people and the elite. Ethno-national elites have successfully created um, the permanent opposition between the people and the people, meaning ethnicities. Um, but the problem is that left populists have abandoned the question of class, unsuccessfully exploring opposition line between the people, meaning ethnicities, and the people, meaning the demos, based mostly on civic nationalism. What uh, would I um, uh, analyze in, in um, uh, my next steps would be also this um, uh, interesting example that left didn't support uh, the plenums of 2014, uh, failing to, to, to use uh, this, these movements um, and to help uh, these people to articulate their problems and to address, um, address some other issues, uh, such as socioeconomic issues uh, that, we, that we have in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Instead, left populists are also um, uh, supporting this permanent political crisis. And I claim that this is in order to maintain neoliberal economic power, all sides uh, working together. So, this is it. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Valida. one little bit depressing picture of Bosnia-Herzegovina, <laughs> yes, I know. I, I propose that we continue with that because it's also connect, uh, connected to Bosnia-Herzegovina and then we will go to Philip. And then you will us. So, <laughs> so, not really. Um, so, mm, I already introduced myself yesterday, but for the people who didn't attend, yesterday's uh, pa panel. I'm Seth Urschel from the Polit uh, fac Faculty of Political Sciences, uh, University of Sarajevo. And yeah, uh, 
as I discussed yesterday, the weather and it's actually always like challenging and difficult to speak about Bosnia because you you feel like you are living in a deja vu as well, that you already spoke about it as well. And actually, nothing changed. And if you read read some books from 1998 or 1999, you find yeah a very clear diagnosis of uh, what's happening today in Bosnia. So I will speak about uh, actually this sort of complex interdependence of, of uh, political elites in Bosnia and the EU bureaucrats that actually affect the, the uh, EU integration process of the country. And uh, the starting point actually for interpretation of permanent crisis of Bosnia and uh, its integration, EU integration process is to determine the actors that bear this sort of constitutive responsibility for structural problems and challenges of the country on the path to the EU. Each interpretation of this kind begins as a sort of political archaeology that addresses political past as the key problem of the country's present. And for the sake of saving time, I will skip this discussion on, of political past and focus on two actors that at any interpretative level are crucial for, uh, for my analysis. Those are EU and ethno-geopolitical entrepreneurs in Bosnia. I use this term ethno-geopolitical entrepreneurs to describe uh, key political actors that use territoriality as a spatial strategy for the purposes of mobilization of ethnic groups and its differentiation to the others in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. An important methodological point for avoiding the trap of, one, of a monoparadigmatic interpretation is to accept the complex interdependence of those actors. So I start from the uh, so from this point of complex interdependence of ethno-geopolitical entrepreneurs and EU bureaucrats when it comes to EU integration, different notions of Europe as a means to shape the political agenda in Bosnia-Herzegovina. How this assumption can be proved? Actually, as a, the complex interdependence is the main pillar of the entire peace agreement on which the Dayton Bosnia-Herzegovina is based. As a consequence of it, the entire period of post-Dayton existence, as a political existence of the country, has been characterized by this interdependence. The notions of the EU and political actors in BIH, uh, the actions, sorry, of the EU and political actors in BIH have never been independent from each other, but dialectically complementary creating the basis for the whole political dynamic in the country. All their actions could be situated in the context of a reaction uh, to each other actions. For instance, many of the changes in EU approach, and I refuse to call it a strategy, uh, towards Bosnia has been decisively shaped by the deliberate obstruction by political elites to implement reforms that would bring about a change in existing ethnocratic order in the country. I can only mention Sejic Finci case, then the structural dialogue on uh, justice reform, etc. EU reaction to these obstructions of reforms by the political elites remains within an explicit and repetitive discourse of democratic character of these political elites. By emphasizing this democratic character in an ethnocratic system, EU contributes to the maintenance of status quo. As the only criteria of democratic nature of political elites, EU uses the nominally democratic character of elections in Bosnia-Herzegovina. By emphasizing this democratic character of political elites, and you using it as an argument to justify, the, just use it as an argument to justify some sort of externalization of, of this responsibility for deadlock in EU integration to the political elites, 
without even questioning the very nature of the political system which fosters and nurtures the ethno-nationalistic character of the political parties. I as of actually had at first a longer presentation, but uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, told me that it should uh, last uh, like up to five minutes. <laughs> Up to, and ten. Up, to <laughs> up to ten. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that many of these <laughs> things we could actually discuss as a, a later as about this actually complex interdependence of uh, the political elites and the EU, EU in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will definitely continue. Uh, you can pass it to Philip. Well, uh, first of all, good morning to all of you, and I'm afraid I'm not the bearer of the good news, so my presentation will be as depressing as the others do regarding the situation in the region, but I don't think it's our fault, so we're just, it's the reality, unfortunately. And I'll, I'll say something about the uh, rise of the ethnic tensions in the Balkans and their, their, their effect on, on, on democracy. Well, a few weeks ago, uh, one uh, major political actor in the in the Balkans said that current period is uh, only an intermezzo between the new regional armed conflict, since the problems which led to the previous wars are still not resolved. Usually, this kind of statement would would uh, I'd say alarm bells would sound if somebody would say something like that, especially if the, the person is the Serbian foreign minister. However, in the Balkans, nobody, nobody reacted because this kind of rhetoric uh, became normality again, unfortunately. Wherever you go, you can hear these kind of statements from, from, from various major political actors. For example, if, 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 if we go to, to, to Bosnia, you can hear basically every week Dodik claiming that it's just a matter of time before the country falls apart. Uh, if you go to the Federation, for example, a few weeks ago, uh, Bakir Izetbegovic said that if Bosniaks would ever feel threatened again, they will answer with, 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 with guns. The same thing said, said, said Hashim Tachi in Kosovo by, by say, saying that uh, Kos Kosovars will answer on, uh, regarding Serbia's threats as they did in the same manner as they did 19 years ago by guns. Uh, if we stay here in Serbia, basically every week uh, defense minister uh, claims something on, on regarding the position on the Serbs that, that borders war, war mongering and so on and so on. This is unfortunately we, we are witnessing the, 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 uh, the rise of the nationalist rhetoric uh, all over the Balkans. And I claim that, that two kind of factors are responsible for, 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 for these deeply concerning developments. First of all, I'll say something about, about external factors. Despite, despite devastating wars in the 90s, the nation nationalism as ideology has not been delegitimized in the, in the Western Balkans. However, this EU conditionality process led to the fact that many, 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 many important political actors abandoned their, their nationalist, nationalist politics. However, two, two developments have put an end to this, this positive political dynamic. First of all, the unprecedented rise of the populist right in the, in, in the West, together with increasing uh, turn to the right of the many, many, many mainstream conservative parties, parties in Europe, and now uh, this uh, rejection of, of fundamental values and principles of liberal democracy, such as tolerance, pluralism, and protection of minority rights is not anymore taboo in the West. And therefore, this affects negatively the situation in the, in the Western Balkans. Second, second, second reason, and perhaps more important, is the fact that the EU had to deal with, with many, many crises, and still, still, still does, from, from of course, uh, Grexit to Ukrainian crisis and migration crisis, and the resulting enlargement fatigue, and not so certain European perspective of, of many, of many, uh, of all basically West Balkan countries, uh, led to the fact that 
that now that basically created a new context in which the, the EU is not the only game in the town. Uh, furthermore, uh, as the EU took a back seat in the Balkan affairs, other actors have been filling the void. Foremost, Russia, which is supporting uh, nationalist, nationalist forces all over the region, especially in Serbia and Montenegro and Mac Macedonia and in, 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 in Republika, Republika Srpska. We all heard about this, um, the, this, this uh, alleged uh, 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 failed coup d'etat in Montenegro. What, what was really going on, we, we still don't know, but there are s serious, serious evidences that there was something really going on from, 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 the, from the Russian side. And what, what I claim is that Moscow seems to be very much aware of, of, the, of the importance of the Western Balkans for the, for the stability of the whole continent. So I think that this growing Russian interest in the, in the Balkans is due to the, this fact and not due to the so-called cultural, cultural pro, pro proximity. But uh, the countries like Russia and Turkey, which ethnic nationalism resonates well with, with, with West Balkan uh, political, political uh, elites. They, they are not the only, the only external factors that have been filling the void in the Balkans. We also have China and Arab countries, and they basically, they basically uh, have a pretty, pretty lucrative offer for the political, political elites. They provide funds, they provide funds, and they don't expect the fulfillment of, of some, some of democratic democratic standards, and I think that's, that, as I said, I think that's a quite lucrative offer for the politicians in the region because in the, this way they can provide economic benefits to their to their electorate without thereby having to implement the necessary reforms. So basically, in other words, they get they get the milk without the cow, and that is uh, I think that all these 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 part they, they are all the parts of the puzzle called. Uh, external uh, external factor and its its importance for the rise of 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 nationalist nationalist rhetoric in the Balkans. However, as I said, I think the this external factor strongly strengthened incentives for nationalist politics. But nevertheless, I argue that the source of of nationalist rhetoric of the increased nationalist rhetoric in the Balkans are the unresolved territorial and identity issues. For just just to name the three uh, Kosovo issues, which is causing the increased tensions not only between between Serbia and Kosovo, but also between between Serbia and Albania. Then you have the uh, dispute about the character of the state in Macedonia. Is Macedonia the state of the Slavic Macedonians, or is the Macedonia the state of both Slavic Macedonians and 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 Macedonian Albanians? So who is basically the state the state holder? And also, of course, the dysfunctionality of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which, which nourishes the, 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 the demands of the, the Serbs for, for secession. These are, and these are the, these, these are the, the issues that they are really, they, 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 were, they were there for, they were always there, basically. But for some period of time, they did not significantly hinder democratic and economic development of the region. Therefore, many, many said, Perhaps they are not so important. Perhaps, perhaps they will solve themselves with, with, with further democratic economic progress. However, the change in the global context showed that this was very naive. Basically, when the exter external, external environment changed, when the EU, when the EU uh, so, 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 sort of left the region and others came, these 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 issues these issues return to the forefront of political de debate debates in the Western Balkans. So, to, 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 in other words, what happened now? In, we have an environment in which in which nationalist agenda has become socially acceptable within the EU. On the one, one hand, on the other hand, we have the the authoritarian and, and authoritarian uh, states play a strong role in the region. And what and this was followed by by the fact that nationalism has become again a legitimate political platform in the Western Balkans. It's not a taboo anymore, it's a legitimate political platform again. And the region, region's political electors are now able to successfully exploit the unresolved territorial and added issues in order to remain in power. And they are doing it in two ways. First of all, 
they are using this us against them identity politics to mobilize their supporters and divert attention away from pressing economic problems. And I think the, the champion of it is, 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 is Milor Dodik because he co he's constantly claiming that all these problems, economic problems that Republika Srpska has are due to the fact that Republika Srpska is part of this functional country, Bosnia and Herzegovina. That's his, 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 main, his main thesis. Uh, in, in addition to that, many political actors instrumentalize these issues in order to strengthen their legitimacy by presenting themselves as champions of, of national, national interests. And, but that, uh, and then uh, this acquired legitimacy is then exploited for the consolidation of power through authoritarian measures. This is, this is especially visible in the strengthening of the executive as well as in the increased control of the media. However, I think that this is very, very dangerous strategy, strategy and it's not co and this and it is causing tensions between neighboring countries and it could it it, it has enormous inherent potential for, for violence. So basically what, what, what could we do? What could we do in order to, 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 to reduce this these ethno the increased ethno nationalist ethno nationalist tensions? I think that we need a new EU approach. And first of all, uh, the EU needs to engage more and offer a, a clear uh, perspective and a realistic European perspective for the countries of the, of the region. And in that context, I think this new alarm strategy on the Europe of the European Commission is, is encouraging. Yet, I'm fully aware of the fact that the examples of Hungary and Poland clearly demonstrate that that the EU membership is not a guarantee uh, for the impotency of nationalism for political mobilization. So if, if we some kind miraculously, so to say, become EU members, this is not a guarantee that nationalism will not play a major role in, the, in, 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 our, in our societies. Therefore, therefore, the sources of nationalism should be eliminated. And those are these already mentioned uh, unresolved ter territorial and, and identity, identity, identity issues. Therefore, I, I argue that EU should not solely focus on the rule of law. It should equally, e equally focus also to, uh, on the resolving of the territorial and identity questions. And I, I'm fully aware of the fact that this is a really hard, difficult task because these unresolved territorial and identity issues are. Uh, for many, uh, they, they are for many, many parties in the Western Balkans raison d'être. They basically, if we would, then they have incentives to resolve these these issues because then they would not be able to manipulate them in order to 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 to, to, to remain to remain in power. Uh, furthermore, the EU lost much of its uh, credibility regarding nationalism because of the rise of nationalism within within its its, its borders. However, I think that. If we, if, if the EU would, if I think that EU now has the, the, the uh, strongest leverage in this, in this, in, 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 in the negotiation uh, process. And this is the window of opportunity that must be used in order to resolve, to resolve these, the, the, these issues because uh, the whole region would benefit greatly. Not only that, uh, not only that the resolution of these issues would uh, safeguard the sustainable, sustainable peace, but it also, it would also promote democratic consolidation because their misuse, the misuse of these issues for a particular interest of the uh, political actors would then, be, would then be impossible. Therefore, and I, I will conclude with it, in a nutshell, I think that the, the, main, the, main, the main obstacle to the sustainable peace and strengthening to democracy in the region is not the in ignorance of the politicians, but it's, uh, it's, it's about uh, incentives and constraints they face. And I think that incentives in the form of realistic EU membership with constraints for the instrumentalization of territorial and identity issues uh, would be of the great, great benefit, benefit uh, to the region. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Philippe, one who dared to propose uh, Solution, Sergeant, you have some thoughts to think of after Philip's presentation, but let's try to be brief because we are already f behind. Okay, thank you. I just uh, have to apologize for my absence yesterday. Um, I was faced with what was called once upon a time objective difficulties. 
Um, and uh, now I'm, I'm here and I'm, I'm privileged to, to take part in this session. Um, and to say a few words on, uh, 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 and to contrast hegemony and democracy, uh, mostly emphasizing and probably describing rather than explaining the, the, how hegemony functions in, in, in this region. And uh, first of all, I, I have to say that I understand the notion of uh, hegemony in political uh, terms as uh, uh, something, some, some sort of uh, illegitimate exercise of power and thus contrasted to democracy. Uh, so uh, the, the, this hegemony, political hegemony basically, is not something that is uh, necessarily specific for Western Balkans or for the Balkan societies or some other underdeveloped uh, uh, regions, but I would say that it is, uh, uh, it, it is also a characteristic of uh, uh, dominant, uh, uh, if I can say, world system also for liberal democracy. Uh, we have these uh, uh, hegemonic uh, uh, narratives and uh, 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 ideas and values and privileged classes and in that terms also liberal democracy is somehow uh, based on this uh, illegitimate hegemony. But uh, it is also important to distinguish between this ontological legitimacy, I would say, uh, and, and uh, some sort of formal uh, legitimacy that uh, liberal democracies still uh, encompass and still exercise. So from formal side, uh, the liberal democracies are legitimate uh, uh, societies. And uh, here comes this, uh, this uh, difference and uh, that's, uh, in, in that terms I distinguish between liberal democracies, uh, developed liberal democracies of the Western world and these uh, um, illiberal democracies in, in, in uh, Western Balkans and uh, in our region. Uh, and uh, what distinguishes uh, these uh, uh, illegitimate or illiberal democracies uh, in, in the Balkans is this exercise of hegemonic uh, political agendas without uh, respecting the internal uh, uh, rules and without uh, uh, any respect for the rule of law. Uh, for instance, uh, I, I think that the major difference between illiberal and uh, uh, liberal democracies uh, that, uh, that is uh, the, uh, the difference in, in the position of this notion of rule of law. Uh, so uh, in uh, the Western Balkans, hegemonic uh, agendas are uh, pushed without any observation uh, for the um, uh, legal uh, boundaries, for the uh, constitutions, or any other sort of, of uh, uh, um, constraints, which is not characteristic for the uh, liberal uh, liberal democracies. And I think that's the, the basic uh, 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 difference, and that's how the, uh, this hegemonic uh, political and cultural and social uh, agendas are being pushed in, in, uh, our, in our context without any, as I said, without any constraints uh, related to uh, uh, legal boundaries, to constitution, to any kind of uh, uh, boundaries that are uh, imposed by, by uh, democratic institutions. And the, the, the major um, uh, element of this uh, exercising of hegemonic uh, uh, politics in the Balkans is actually the weakness of the institutions. And there is uh, a reversibility uh, between uh, uh, exercising hegemonic uh, uh, politics uh, at one side and on the other uh, weakness of the institutions. It is also uh, always somehow interrelated. Uh, uh, you need uh, weak institutions so that you could can push your uh, um, illiberal uh, uh, hegemonic uh, uh, agendas. And this also uh, destroys uh, from its side uh, the, the, the institutions. Uh, and speaking about this uh, political hegemony, it 
also uh, demands very few uh, and very basic, I would say, uh, 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 elements, and this is uh, uh, firstly ideology, then you, uh, it, it affects uh, uh, identity, and uh, maybe the third element are uh, friends and enemies. And I think in this very simplified triangle, uh, political elite exercise uh, uh, whatever uh, agenda they, they, they would like to, to, to impose to, to, to society. Um, and all the three are actually very much uh, related to each, to each other. And uh, I would support this uh, idea that the revival of nationalism is the major um, ideological pattern in, in, in this region at the moment. And uh, what is important, uh, not only for this revival of nationalist uh, wave, but also for uh, understanding the importance of nationalism in previous pe period, in my uh, uh, view, it is not that uh, nationalism was just a bourgeois ideology aimed at uh, 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 supporting um, uh, uh, capitalist society that were emerging and so on and so on. I think usually it is so, but I think that nationalist uh, ideology uh, in this region was somehow um, uh, um, autonomous from this uh, 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 basic motivation, I would say, and, and it was uh, uh, it, it had some sort of uh, functional autonomy. So uh, I can uh, explain it better maybe by, by uh, asking the question, uh, would it be possible to, to uh, change nationalist paradigm in, re in the interest of, uh, of uh, capital, of uh, 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 capitalist uh, uh, circles and so on? And I doubt. So I do think that uh, at certain point, nationalism becomes uh, functionally independent as ideology, not just the function of capitalist society or uh, of transition and so on. And I think that's the, the, the major uh, uh, problem also in our discussions on, on the left, uh, which is uh, an, another, another point here. Uh, but I would uh, subscribe uh, what the previous uh, speaker uh, told about about this uh, revival of nationalism. I was somehow moved to, to make comment on, on this. So uh, the, the major question is, if I describe this uh, context uh, properly, how to deal with it, how to change it, or how to explain it, because this is basically just a uh, dis description of the of the problem. And I think that within liberal paradigm, we cannot go further from uh, influence of the elites. You, you just need responsible e elites. If you do not have them, your, your society would be very much uh, uh, um, faced with the, the reproduction of, uh, of uh, uh, narratives that are uh, basically um, uh, as I said, nationalist and uh, anti-European and anti-Western and so on. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, as I said, within liberal paradigm, I really do not see any other uh, potential uh, within society apart from uh, so-called benevolent or responsible elites who would face the, the who would just try to change their uh, narrative. And uh, also, I doubt that it is. Uh, uh, something that uh, could uh, happen um, accidentally. So that's something that uh, the, the, the society and the, the elites should work on. And uh, in previous time uh, and uh, in, in previous history, we were actually faced with very uh, um, different role of the elites who were uh, and still are uh, very much uh, uh, involved in this uh, reproduction of uh, nationalist and, and, uh, and anti-Western, anti-European, and also anti-socialist, anti-communist narrative that uh, stick only to this very narrow national, national interests and national uh, ideologies, nationalist ideologies, which are actually uh, still, as I said, uh, in this hegemonic position in, in this region which that was very much uh, uh, explained by, by my previous uh, uh, speaker. So Thank briefly you. that would be from my side.
Thank you so much. Actually, I would like to challenge the, the notion of responsible elites who are needed to change the things, but I will first give a floor to Yelena who... Uh, yes, please. Thank you all very much. It was really, really interesting to, to listen to you all. I just have a couple of, of questions. So firstly, I want to fully agree with Sujan Milosevic that I think that the idea that nationalism is functionally uh, autonomous here is really, really important for the emerging, especially for the emerging left movements to realize because uh, <clears throat> they, they want to, to kind of uh, address it as, as a bourgeois question, as a question of capitalism, and I think that, that we have any hope for, for the emerging left here, not only in Serbia, if they don't realize the, uh, fully and completely the, the strength of the nationalism as an autonomous phenomenon here. Uh, secondly, for Filip Milicic, um, so you concluded your presentation with a sort of a uh, proposal for, I mean proposal, like you said that we need to, uh, we need to work out, we need to, to, to solve the territorial questions, but you actually didn't say what would that be. I mean, how, for example, what would you do with Kosovo? We have Danielovic here with us, he was very outspoken in the public about his ideas of, of, um, of, uh, uh, making some kind of a division line, because I think that the, and this has something to do with what Milosevic said about nationalism as, a, as an auto being something, be, fun functioning autonomously. I think that this narrative about impossibility of resolving territorial issues is built in this national. So whatever solution one might propose, it's already, you know, it's, it's already <laughs> subverted, you know, that's because that, there's, that's, that, that's the narrative, that's the, na the narrative is something that, ha and it, it functions autonomously, it has nothing to do with concrete proposals, so whatever you do, um, there's already lurking narrative that we say it's not going to work and there's, there's going to be someone or some parts that will not be. So how do you do it? So it's not only a question of, uh, it's not an ontological question of what you're going to do with borders. It's also the question of how these solutions are perceived, you know, and they are uh, always already perceived as not non-satisfactory. So that's the problem. So we have also an epistemological problem. And finally, a question of um, maybe for Valid, I don't know about all, on populism. So have you maybe read the, the latest article of Rogers Brubaker on populism? I just think that he published it a couple of, of months ago, and I strongly disagree with him. It's uh, he try. I mean, the thing is with because there's this fight between those who think that it's a useful notion and those who think that it's not a useful notion and then he tries to save populism as a notion and then he wants to describe it not in terms of political content. So he says, okay, both Jeremy Corbyn and Orban are populists. Okay, they are completely different. One is democrat for democratic values, one, the other is not. But it's what he says, we should concentrate on this discursive styles and the repertoire on discursive style. And populism can be defined by the specific ways politicians and political elites combine these styles. And I think that even though it's, it has some uh, logical justification, I think it's very, very dangerous because it, uh, if it uh, shifts our, it kind of fo uh, forces us to f to focus and to be more attentive to to, to discursive uh, plays and to discursive displays instead of content, which is really important when you want to. So, what do you think about that? About the populism as something that maybe um, we should clearly define, or maybe not not use in public at all, or I don't know. Is it is it a dangerous concept, especially if we focus on if we want to define populism in terms of discursive practices, not in terms of political content. Uh, well, we can start from Valida, for example, because we don't have any more hands raised for the moment. Yeah, okay. Unfortunately, I'm not sure. Sometimes I think that there is a clearly defined strategy and content between um, this empty rhetoric that we have because of the persistence and constancy uh, of when I, when I look not only our context but also the context. I think that um, even though they are 
using this empty rhetoric that is kind of repetition and you know uh, it is it is a dangerous thing because it's persistently you know promoting an ideology that is behind this and this is the, the ideology of autonomous <laughs> nationalism and very strong nationalism so um, yeah, I think that all those definitions, the problem is that, that they are staying on this superficial level, uh, especially because most of them are uh, analyzing uh, actually political communication, political populist communication, and not going into, into the, you know, deeper analysis. Uh, so, uh, it is the concept that I would dismiss too, maybe, and this is the reason that I'm concentrating now, especially because it's, it's um, you know, now it started to be in everyday life, something that media are using uh, in everyday life, and so, and it's creating a confusion, and sometimes we miss to define some things that are behind behind this, this um, and they have this really, really manipulative, nationalistic, uh, homophobic, uh, racist content, often not, not, maybe not so much racist in, in our context, but if you, if you look some, some, some other examples in, in, in European Union or in the world, you will see that they are <laughs> dangerous, dangerous uh, um, essence in, 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 in this concept. So I will read this. I, I didn't have the opportunity to see this article. Thank you. Uh, Professor Jovic uh, raised the hand. Uh, yes. Then, then. I, I agree with you. I agree. It's really hard to resolve it. Not only because of the of the of the elite, but but because these are deeply polarizing issues in the, in the wider public. But I think that uh, they are they must be resolved because you know, one way or the other. Because they generate those issues generate nationalism, they generate polarization, they generate extremism, and they are really damage, uh, damaging damaging not only the. Uh, the, the democracy in a country, but they are damaging the whole political system. They are damaging the whole society because they are, they are, they, they are causing this this polarization, depolarization. They are causing the extremism. And if you ask me about about particularly the question of Kosovo, I think whoever whoever decides, whoever accepts reality that that Kosovo is lost, he will do a great. He will he will help Serbia very very much because then you don't have this issue that is generating myths that is generating that is basically that is basically generating the whole this nationalist discourse and then you when when that's gone then you need to focus on some other issues then you need to focus on issues yeah but it, not 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 immediately but but not not immediately but maybe in 10 15 20 years I like take germany's example if if the elite didn't accept after the second world war the new the new uh, border with poland of course in after 20 years it, it was still i think probably ursel knows this much better than me but it, it didn't happen like after five years after a few years ago after a few years that whole society accepted the new border but then you have this process and i think or, uh, you know, in, uh, on the long run, so to say, eventually people will 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 accept it, and then the elites would focus on on on, on some on some other issues. But as long as these issues are open, then they they are damaging damaging the the the, the, the democracy. They are damaging. They are really because they generate, as I said, they generate nationalism. They are the source of nationalism. And if you eliminate the source, then of course not. Like I said, in the beginning, uh, not much would, 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 would be changed, but uh, eventually, I think, eventually, this, 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 would, be, this would be very beneficial to, to the society. But I, I, I'm fully aware of the fact that whoever decides to do this in Serbia, not only that he will lose elections, but maybe something worse. Okay, now we have Professor Jovic, Ivan and Jovan.
Thank you. Um, I, I like the presentations. I have, um, however, some uh, comments, uh, maybe um, not really as a criticism, but just as a kind of proposal for, for further thinking. Um, and it concerns the external actors. I think, I mean, Philip mentioned um, many of them, but I feel that the one that's been most present here and uh, most decisive, that's the United States, is also external somehow. And I don't know where did this, le where did the leftist approach uh, lose uh, ability to criticize the United States <laughs> in the first place, I think. I mean, it's also almost paradoxical when we mention like external actors, it's Russia, Turkey, we could say also United Arab Emirates, which are building some, you know, whatever, they, or Qatar or whoever is building some buildings here, and then other actors that are building, you know, mosques and, and, and contributing to corruption in, in, in these lands as well. Um, we, we, we identify them very, very easily, but um, it's the United States that decided, decisively contributed to the situation in the region that we have, including, for example, ethno-politics in, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and in Kosovo. And I would say it's the United States also that, at the moment, especially with Trump, are the main uh, support or ideational, uh, ide ideational support or actor um, that has been supported here also by the right-wing extremists. It's enough to see Sheshe being you know, very much in love with Trump and, and so on and so forth. And uh, so I think what we really need is emancipation from the United States, to be honest, if we ever want to have Europe one and inclusive um, for everyone. I think for as long as we, yeah, of course, we don't have Eurasian concept. Europe doesn't think in these terms. I mean, it's been introducing sanctions against Russia and so on and so forth. But we still have Euro-Atlantic concept, almost as if there is no difference. So I think the key for Europe would be to emancipate itself not only from the East, but from the West. And it's actually, to be now self-critical, I think it's us in the Balkans who very much enable the United States to stay in Europe after 1989 and remain more powerful in Europe and actually prevent Europe from being one uh, because their presence here in the Balkans is presence in Europe. I mean, Kosovo is not a Serbian problem, it's a European problem. It prevents united foreign policy and security policy of Europe as well. So I think uh, we need to be a bit more, I think, critical about that. When it comes to um, the sources of nationalism. It's, of course, more complex. Um, I think I've always believed that one of the sources of nationalism is in frustrations and the sense of humiliation and inequality that is being produced by such a long and hesitant approach, such a long delay and hesitant approach of the European Union towards the countries of Western Balkans. The longer they wait for the membership, the longer they, f the longer they feel unequal, excluded, and treated unfairly. So in my view, if they wait for another decade or two, things will get worse and not better. And that's why I'm in favor of, of immediate inclusion uh, based on realistic approach. You, know, you, you need to expand when you can and for as long as you can, rather than to wait these countries to get better because they will not get better by waiting. Yeah, and I think you know, just an illustration. You know, when there was Oran Jinjic's government here in 2000, 2003, Euro had European Union then uh, told Serbia, "Okay, if you change, you will join together with Croatia, not country by country, but together with Croatia." It, from this perspective, there was absolutely enough time for this to happen. If there were 13 years for Croatia to join. If they sent that message under, to support Gingic in 2001 or two, this could have happened. We wouldn't have bilateral problems, rising nationalism in Croatia that wants to use EU membership to pressurize its neighbors and so on and so forth. And then they didn't do this. They didn't do this under Tadic. And then we got Vucic. If they don't do this under Vucic, we are going to get uh, the victory of an opposition which is more far right and right wing, mobilized on Kosovo, 
uh, than Vucic is at the moment. So I think the EU is actually missing opportunities, and I think that's why I'm in favor of, of quick inclusion. I know, of course, there are risks with that, but there are risks with everything in politics. So we need to wait between, wait, to, to measure the risks, whether they are bigger if they are out, or whether they are bigger if they, if they join the European Union. And then thirdly, nationalism. Yes, I mean, I think we all can agree here, we are not, I mean, I don't see anyone who is here very much a nationalist, and it's very difficult, I, it's very difficult to reconcile nationalism with the left. But, but then again, um, we need also to admit and accept that leftist politics in the past has contributed to nationalism occasionally, and very often. I mean, the, the right to, to self-determination, including secession, which is, came from Stalinism, <laughs> has been implemented to Yugoslavia in the constitutional structure. And, and also, the institutional structure of former Yugoslavia did contribute to nationalism. We shouldn't be blind about that. Yeah. It was ethnopolitics as well at that time. If you think the League of Communists what, didn't end up as a coalition of nationalist parties, then we are missing, actually, something in, in, the, in the analysis as well. And sometimes I wonder, then again, whether, you know, whether we need a different type of nationalism uh, rather than, rather than ethno-nationalism, right? and whether we can have it. Because I would like to see more consolidated states that are not waiting for a frozen conflict and for permanent uncertainty. And this we can probably do by probably supporting civic nationalism or something like that, rather than ethnic. Now, how can we do this? This is now, of course, an open question. But sometimes I wonder, for example, that you know, the, the, the lack of will to have a state sometimes is a problem. In Bosnia, for example, the lack of will of all, at least two, and probably also some elements in the third part of this, the lack of will for statehood and for civic nationalism is a bit of a problem. And, and I, I think the same for, for Serbia and for Kosovo, which are ethno-nationalism ethno is strong, but civic nationalism, uh, not really. So, you know, we are opening, we are opening uh, again, a more theoretical debate, which is, which is of course, always more, more complex. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just have a brief question, uh, though I'm not sure whether it's directed towards the, the persons presenting about the Bosnian case, because it seems to me that Bosnia might be an example. Uh, nonetheless, regarding the politics in the region, it seems to me that nationalism nowadays is somehow different than the nationalism we had 28 years ago. If we look at the rhetorics, uh, the patterns, the language that is used, uh, the methods that are used and so on, uh, it seems that we can't say that the nationalism we had 28 years ago is copy-pasted into the nowadays political arena. It seems that we have uh, it's also an ethnic nationalism, so it's not a civic nationalism by all means, but it seems that it appears in a different shape and it uses different methodology than it used before. So maybe what are your thoughts uh, about this and could this be said, because it seems from a Croatian pers perspective that this is true, that the nationalism we've had, uh, maybe Professor Jovic can correct me, but it seems that there is a huge difference between nationalism 28 years ago and now. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's the case for Bosnia, so can you maybe clarify that a little bit? Can we just uh, hear Jovana and then I will... Actually my comment is really going along uh, from the moment when I raise my hand uh, uh, the speakers already tackled some of the issues that I was uh, thinking about. I don't have a clear answer but I, I'm doubtful about the statement that um, nationalism exists as an independent ideology nowadays. I, I think that there is not one nationalism, but several different types of nationalism, both in uh, ways of content uh, and in the ways of uh, the, their political activation, the way it uh, is used and expressed. And, um, and <clears throat> especially because nationalism, whatever that is, uh, nationalistic ideas are very usable, um, but uh, I'm wondering whether uh, are very politically usable. But I'm wondering whether it's a 
whether we can explain really the behavior of political actors nowadays only by nationalistic motivations. Because uh, just by looking at uh, Vucic, you can see the shift in opinions about key national symbols, uh, uh, Kosovo, Bosnia, and so forth. Uh, and uh, um, you can see that it's not really the content of his nationalism, but we still perceive him as a nationalist because he is selling himself in that way. So I think in that way maybe nationalism is a sort of uh, populism in the Brubaker, in the sense that Brubaker wanted to promote that it's more a style, uh, an emblem, uh, a type of coat you are wearing, but it's not really a content, uh, some concrete, ideology and set of coherent ideas uh, that, um, that are motivating political actors because if that would be the case uh, then um, uh, many actors are not consistently nationalistic, they are not really sticking to their uh, ideology and then whatever that ideology is, is an empty concept. So I think maybe we, we should think about nationalisms as different types and forms of political behavior, but uh, I, I'm, uh, I would not um, support uh, thinking about it uh, as a uh, like coherent or autonomous ideology of its own. Um, this is just my thinking and I would like to hear feedbacks on that. Okay, Sergeant. Thank you for, for the comment, uh, um, because uh, I think that I raised the question of uh, uh, nationalism as, uh, as uh, functionally autonomous, and I thought uh, functionally autonomous from uh, this uh, transitional uh, process, from this uh, uh, bourgeois uh, uh, um, uh, renovation of, of a bourgeois society and so on. So, it's not necessarily strongly related to transition, to uh, revival of capitalism, which is pretty much uh, uh, argued by the some leftist uh, circles. I would say that, uh, uh, of course, uh, ideologies that are uh, 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 flourishing within bourgeois society uh, are mostly uh, uh, aimed at uh, support and uh, some sort of uh, uh, Yes, uh, giving support to, to, to this society. But uh, as I said, my question is, uh, is there any uh, uh, ideology uh, that would uh, push further that uh, capitalist uh, uh, agenda or uh, to do in favor of capitalist uh, society and capitalist circles that could somehow push aside uh, nationalism in, in this region? And I think there is no. And in that terms, I would say that nationalism is, uh, uh, at certain point, it becomes independent from its service to uh, bourgeois uh, or capitalist society, only in that terms. So not that it is a, a homogeneous uh, idea, that it has uh, some sort of uh, strong structure within itself. Of course, it's everything changeable. It operates with very basic uh, three or four uh, ideas, we are victims, we can be victims of the West, of the America, of the Russia, of uh, the neighbors, of the Croats, it's always, you know, you can change it and then again you can say, okay, we will recognize the independence of Kosovo, but it's only because of the pressure upon us and it's always uh, about uh, pressure made by, by uh, Western governments and then uh, you, you are not facing the, 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 the reasons for, for uh, why Kosovo actually became uh, independent. Uh, so uh, if you are not facing the um, uh, major uh, questions about, uh, uh, for instance, Kosovo, uh, then even if you recognize the independence of Kosovo, it would mean basically nothing, because the narrative would still remain. That's injustice, but we just have to do that. Albanians are bad, we are good, we are victims. We, okay, we have to recognize it, but uh, still we are the victims and we have to wait for the uh, change of the geopolitical strategies and so on and to regain our 
Kosovo and next year in Pristina, next year in Prizren and so on. And to live in this kind of narrative. Uh, Ursula, raise the hand. Can you just pass across the... A small aspect, not just covering the Western Balkans. I'm pretty well aware that those who considered themselves being part of progressive or left forces over the decades understood themselves internationalistic and this nationalism, something, forget about it. But a uh, speech by our new president, and our president does, ha does have a very limited political impact, well, gave me last year some advice to reconsider this logic, because uh, nationalistic movements, and the colleagues in the morning mentioned that they are very much successful, a bit too successful, in my opinion, but they are entering parliaments at home, and they are entering governments. And the question is, uh, what are the recipes? This is just to walk out the streets and all oh, this is nationalism is bad. Guys, you have seen what we have done as Germans with these nationalistic movements in the last century. Or trying to understand why sometimes even well-educated middle-class people are ready to listen to these stupid guys. And the question is, on which level can we organize, for example, what is among their demands, solidarity or this social security or others. Can we do it on the European level or inside the European Union? Unfortunately, we can't. Therefore, the state level is the one we need, a strong, stronger states than we have, to address these demands of some well-educated people who are ready to accept the stupid ideas of our newborn nationalists. Therefore, fighting just against, while well, some definitions won't lead to better results for progressive forces or any kind of civic engagement, I fear. And therefore, what is the opposite or can be the other vision to deal with these nationalistic movements and what I've seen in recent months is at home guys started to debate about what is, was really shocking when I heard first about it, this is what is my homeland, because homeland this sounds very American and all internationals have been to a certain extent very critical about the policies of the United States, but I need it, we need to dig deeper to find better results. Philip, yeah. Yeah, uh, first of all, a few, um, uh, some of my thoughts regarding Professor Yoi's comments. I, I agree fully with you regarding regarding Trump, and I mean, just not only if he in Serbia, there was this comic situation with, with Shashil wearing his, his the T-shirt with, with his face, and also in Zagreb where those when they marched, marched, uh, singing his name. So, yeah, that's why I said that the, the unprecedented rise in the West. And uh, maybe I should be more clear, not, not only either, uh, I didn't only uh, think about Western Europe, but also also, also, also the, the United States. And I also agree that, that's why I said that we, the EU needs to have a realistic and clear, the offer is realistic and clear uh, European perspective, because I think I think without without this this we, we will witness authoritarian backsliding in in in, in the region. That's that, that's for sure. But however, I I, I don't think that that uh, nationalism only flourishes in in a society with with in a poor society, so as to say. Because in the recent years we witnessed that nationalism flourishes in a most developed West European societies. And I when I was doing research about about right wing populism in the West, and I and I found data that 40% of the voters of the alternative for Germany have high incomes. So these are not losers of the globalizations or the lower class of the society. There are people, 40% have high incomes. So, and uh, 
regard, regarding uh, Ursula's comment, I think that left had made a huge mistake by by leaving uh, leaving uh, by allowing the right to to have a monopoly on on a national identity issue, and the left only focused. On, on identity politics from minority perspectives. They also say encouraged and supported the rights of the, of the minorities, sexual, national, racial uh, minorities. However, they neglected identity issues from, from majority perspectives, so to say. And then the right captured, then the right has the monopoly on those issues. And I think in order to, to, to fight successfully, the, 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 the right-wing populism, the, the left needs to invent its own narrative regarding, regarding the national identity. It needs to uh, develop uh, this sense of we and con counter-narrative to, to this ethnic homogeneity or cultural homogeneity project of the, of the, of the, of the, of the right-wing. Uh, need to focus on the civic nationalism, need to emphasize the values, and like I said, the focus on the civic nationalism you need to offer the society their own a narrative that would counter the, the, the narrative of, of, of the right of, of the right wing populism. Because we, the left, if, if the left has to develop it, because if we allow the right wing to have a monopoly on these issues, then this will only make situation universe. Thank you. Uh, just a few comments to question asked by Ivan. Uh, as well, I wouldn't actually agree with, uh, yeah, your comment that you, that we have as uh, different nationalisms in in Bosnia Herzegovina and uh, Croatia. Actually, they share so many commonalities. As well. both are very pronounced uh, religious and. Uh, we could describe them as a more as religious nationalism than as a solely as nationalisms. Then, uh, besides this, as a, besides the religion as its main reference point, uh, as a, they also used uh, as a, this historical adversity as a, between the ethnic groups. Then the Second World War as a reference point. So we have this unresolved uh, issue of fascistic movements in, in the region which are uh, actually prized by the, some of the ethnic groups as, 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 as the uh, defenders as well of the nation, etc. And uh, what, what is also a commonality is actually that we experienced in Bosnia, Herzegovina and Croatia this reconfiguration of, of, of a geopolitical space. Street names were changed and the toponyms in countries uh, as a, a way not only to, to break with the previous ideology or previous regime, but also uh, to break with the Bosnia and the Croatia uh, as we have known it before before the war. Also what they actually wanted is uh, to make this uh, political uh, space only known to, to the majority ethnic ethnic uh, groups uh, in, in both countries and uh, as maybe we could actually only establish some as a very small nuances in, 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 as a, in both nationalism that differentiate but at the at, at the as a, if we uh, look at uh, the nationalism in both countries in, in their entirety, they are as well, they share many as well, common futures. Thank you. Well, if there are any more uh, hands raised, I would just like to briefly comment on what Srdjan uh, uh, said, is that we need responsible elites. That was really uh, interesting. Uh, in a way, I disagree and agree. Uh, because in order to change, I mean, I don't believe that there is society without elites. In that way, I agree. But uh, uh, where where those elites are going to come from? That's a problem in this region, I think. Because in in this uh, current situation, uh, either they will be built from external factors, whatever we call external factors, either they will uh, emerge in a Gramscian way, let's say from, from bottom-up uh, 
citizen movements, etc. And uh, you can see, like, uh, you can see attempts uh, in a way to do the both things. Uh, in, a, in a previous 20 years, we had a lot of attempts to build a new elite without major success, obviously, having in mind what we have now. But we have, for the moment, maybe we have some, and that, that was initial, basically, uh, idea behind this workshop to see uh, whether it's possible to have some new elites or not elites, maybe uh, you would disagree that those are elites, who are coming from the citizen movement and who are trying to challenge the current uh, situation and current things as they are now. Uh, having in mind ethnopopulism, having in mind uh, uh, neoliberal, uh, uh, strong neoliberal system which is uh, entrenched here for the moment in the region. But the, the basically, that is the key question of the change in our region. Who will change the things? And in what, how, to, how to reach the position and power to change the things, having in mind that we are uh, now much more than, let's say, 70, 50 years ago, uh, uh, connected due uh, to globalization, due to all these uh, interconnected uh, affairs uh, between we cannot uh, do it on our own we have to be part of the larger somehow movement I, I don't believe that it's possible to change a regime in Serbia without uh, somehow affecting other other re parts of the region and not only a region Europe wide for example I think that's that's really the key question who will do the things and I will close with <laughs> this session Let's